Yeah. I'm just the finest piece thinking. of transportation, and we'll get some real hoo-hahs over this. I'm saying experience without education and training, forget it. Truth. You have to take everything and pay an extra two grand or whatever, or none of it. I mean, there should be more flexibility. Motoring 93 is brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, one tough motor oil. And Midas, your under-the-car specialists for imports and domestics. This week, something a little different on Motoring 93. We are going to dedicate the entire half hour to discussing one of the most exhilarating and frustrating experiences most of us go through on a daily basis driving your car. And behind me at that table, we've gathered together some people who live and breathe the automobile on a daily basis. Some of these faces you're going to recognize. There's Jim Kenzie, of course, every week on Kenzie's Corner. Also, Graham Fletcher, who's behind the wheel every week on Test Drive on Motoring 93. Joining them, Carola Vina, a syndicated columnist with the Toronto Star. Gary Magwood, a driving educator. Staff Sergeant John Salats from the Metropolitan Toronto Police Department, and John Cox, who has been racing and selling cars most of his life, and whose dealership is acting as our studio. Let's listen in as they discuss driving in the 90s. You know, every time I get in my car, I swear these people are getting their licenses out of cereal boxes. I, don't, I can't believe the kind of driving we see in the road. Gary, you're an expert in driver training. You've been involved in this stuff. What do we have to do to improve the quality of driving on our roads? The only way you're going to make any changes is exactly the same thing as we've done with, with, uh, with smoking, drinking, driving issue. The public's perception of the task has to be changed. If, if you perceive the task to be so simple, so easy, as I say to the students all the time across the country, it must be easy. Your parents can do it. And that's the story. We perceive the task to be so simple that Obviously, no training is needed and very little testing is needed to put us on the road. I think you have to look at it, as Gary says, what's happening now out there is that people are being trained and being taught and educated by their parents who are bad drivers and their parents before them and their parents before them. Even driver training people that are out there now aren't totally qualified to give driving instructions to people. That's true. Uh, there's people who have language barriers there, you know, different multicultural groups that are out there are being trained by other cultural groups who don't even understand what the driver training systems about or what the driver trainer is saying. Well, I know this is a national show and I hate to bring up the fact that I live in Ontario, but in Toronto you can get your license at the appropriately named John Rhodes Test Center and never go on a public road. Never go over 50 kilometers an hour. You do a three-point turn, you do a parallel park, millions of people are slaughtered. How about slaughtered. a multi-lane highway, highway at 5 o'clock in the evening with the pouring rain? But that's yeah. what you drive yeah. home in. You, you, they exciting. test you at 30 miles an hour. And I asked the examiners one time, how come you don't take the people out on the roads? The answer, it's too dangerous. <laughs> yep. So well, you're you're the you know the interesting yeah. thing? Yeah. Um, I know um, somebody that wrong? failed up at the John Rhodes <clears throat> Centre because they didn't imagine enough imaginary cars coming down the street. They came to a T-junction, they were forced to stop, and they didn't wait long enough for these imaginary cars to go by before they pulled out, so he failed it. Well, the well there's the advantages. The problem is getting a license. I think it's too easy to keep a license. I don't think that it should be your right for life to keep your license once you've got it. I think they should be testing, uh, retesting every five years. If you fail, you get a temporary license. You go out, take a refresher course, get tested huh? again, and earn that, earn the right to keep that the only, The only problem with giving, giving our authorities, our government, or whichever province you happen to live in, is that once you give them that kind of power, they immediately abuse it. <laughs> Because that's what governments do, they abuse everything. You know, John, you made an interesting point earlier, and, and I think some of the frustration we find across the country, we, we have seen a huge influx of, of, of people from, from other countries. But one of the things that's being overlooked with that whole process is we, sitting at this table, and the majority of us, grew up sitting in the back seats of cars watching mom and dad go through the process. We are now looking at drivers arriving here, 25, 30, 35 years old, who have not gone through that process, plunking behind the, the, the wheel of a car, giving them an exactly the same amount of education and training that we'd give somebody who's watched the process. And we know that you learn everything from the time you're, you're this high. And expecting them to deal with the traffic, with the cars, with all the conditions that, that are there present in this country. And a large part of it is, is to do with the fact that it's first generation. Every wave of immigration, if you look at the uh, years ago when, when we looked at as the Portuguese came in and, and, and the various, we always were critical as Canadians of, of and it's first generation, second generation drivers had no problem at all. So that's, that's something that really needs to be addressed. It's not the language you take it in, 
It's the fact that you're Judge, not... Judging from a couple yeah. of the accents here, we got a couple of first generation. No. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is an interesting point. When I was in the army... Let's talk about service. Now, in today's car, we've talked about how far cars have come in terms of safety Technology, and everything else. Yeah. Now you've got to talk about fixing them. In today's market, I'm sure you can bear me up. Like the manufacturer will give you uh, a basic level of training, but until the guy has actually worked on it, he's trying to find a needle in a haystack when he hasn't been told which haystack to have a look in. And as a consumer, that means it's going to cost you money. The instant the car's out of warranty, now fortunately warranties are getting longer today, but nonetheless, you're still looking. Boy, they're amazing. You can is break down fortunate? on the side of the road, flat tire, and they'll come and pick you up and look after you. Is that fortunate or is that sort of more sales promotion? Because no, no. you buy a car and you get, first of all, they start off with a 60,000 kilometer warranty. Now you go up to 140,000 kilometer warranty. You're just bringing the car back every 5,000 kilometers for another checkup, you're just bringing it back, initiating more business, I think, for yourself. No, no. Well, you are and you aren't, because the interesting thing is, and if, if you listen to the dealer, he will lead you to believe that you must take the car back to the dealer for service in order to maintain the warranty. Horses hooey. You don't have to go back to the dealer for that. The dealer would like you to go back, and in fact, some of them will turn around and I won't say barefaced life, but they turn around and say, unless you come you know, back here, you don't have a warranty. That's a crock of <laughs> before, pardon me. You know, you guys, you, you really team me off. First of all, we're talking about the technology which goes into these vehicles. I mean, have you ever looked under the hood of one of these cars? You're still driving a 1980 what? I mean, you can fix that with a hammer and a screwdriver. Try one of these monsters that we sell nowadays. Try and look at the fuel that's injection. That's a specialty Try car. That's a specialty car. I'm talking about the average family car. car which is which the average is family car absolutely is up to date in its technology. You want to take it to a corner garage? Only for maintenance. Guy, only for maintenance. Nonsense maintenance. If if what are you talking about? What's the old story? What do you, if you want? Enough you get monkeys your oil in change? a room. You want to get your oil they change type an intelligent change? story. Have you seen no, 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 no. the monkeys Ch that do that? Changing oh, an know. oil and really changing an oil and filter is not difficult. Excuse me, changing oil and changing a filter should be done by a qualified technician because if you get one of these so-called monkeys that you're talking about those are your words not mine that monkey's going to make a mistake and you know who it's going to cost it's going to cost you as the owner of the car oh, yeah. because when a car is taken into a dealership that dealership guarantees the work and that dealership will honor any of the problems that come up it also, if they detect a problem, they can go back to the manufacturer and take care of it, and the manufacturer will assist. In fact, he'll take care of everything. You go to your local corner store, wonderful, isn't please do that. Well, no, I'm not... Isn't I'm not, that where the dealership is making a lot of its money, though, is in the service end Excuse me, check the economy. I don't know personally of any, any dealerships that, uh, that are making a lot of money at the moment, but, but they rely listen, if you that, want technicians to fix your car, these cars which are so high tech, excuse me, do you know how, many, how much money I have to spend every month sending technicians all over North America to get them trained and brought up to speed on all the ne new technology? You want to take it to some corner station where the guy hasn't got out of working on Model T Fords yet, <laughs> and you want him, sure he'll fix it for 20 bucks. John, the difference John? is it'll take him eight weeks to get it right. Okay, hold everything for a minute here. My round table may not be quite as nice as yours, but I, I got to get my two cents worth in here. Regarding this dealer versus independent service debate, I don't think there's any hard, fast answer. There are definitely instances where the dealer may serve your service or repair needs better than anybody else, but there's an awful lot of instances where they don't. And if you're buying a car that requires a licensed dealer mechanic to change the oil and the filter and the air filter and things like that, routine, simple service operations, I think you're probably buying the wrong kind of car. But in any case, there's no reason why an independent can't do as good a job as the dealer. But it's getting increasingly difficult. You have to be more committed. You have to go for training. You have to buy the right parts. You have to have shop manuals. You've got to keep yourself abreast of what's going on in this trade. Just to give you an example, it'd be a heck of a lot easier for me to source all these filters from one aftermarket supplier. I'd make more money. It'd make my life a lot easier. But we get filters for Hondas from Honda, Ford filters from Ford and GM, etc. There's no question that the parts have to be good to service these cars. So we we don't uh, we don't try and use aftermarket or parts that could be a problem for the customer later if he ever has a warranty claim. 
We make sure we use good parts, we get the training, and we do the job properly. But it takes a big commitment, and you're going to have to be prepared to spend more and more money, you service guys, to keep abreast of what's happening in today's cars. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 93. I always get at least one Kenzie's Corner comment a year on my favorite topic, Section 126 of the Highway Traffic Act, <laughs> a left lane bandit. Does anybody here have any clue what those people think they're doing out there? I mean, are they asleep or what? They, they don't know what the lane is for. That's the problem. I mean, people are driving who've been driving for years that still don't know what the passing lane is for. Education they, and training. They figure if nobody else is right in front of them or right behind, well, it doesn't matter where anybody else is, they're just darn well going to do what they want the to do. The lane discipline in North America is, has always been pathetic. If you compare it to, to instance, the Autobahn, or even in the old M1 and the rest of it, I mean, there, you want to go quickly, you're on the, the left-hand lane. If you want to go slowly, you get in the right-hand lane, and if you're just at an average speed, you're in the middle. Part you know, of and the that's problem the way it should be. are the signs. Sense. When you have a sign that says, uh, um, slower cars keep to the right, yeah. that's the wrong sign to put up on a multi-lane highway. If you're doing 100 clicks, and it's a 100 click highway, I'm not a slower car, I'm going to stay. If you had a sign that says, keep right, except the path, exactly. then you're going to at least get Very the message simple across. Solution. But isn't, isn't, isn't that what they do oh. in Europe? Well, we do sure have some do. of those signs yeah. in Ontario. Well, they, the problem is people don't read the signs. But Most of them yeah. say... Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Slower vehicles keep to the right. I want to change the subject here for a minute. What really bugs me is when you go to buy a new car, there really aren't very many options. Everything is sold in packages. You have to take the power locks and, the, and the half a dozen other things. You can't just pick and choose the particular things, options that you want with that car. You have to take everything and pay an extra two grand or whatever, or none of it. I mean, there should be more flexibility, more options in, in what you get or yeah. what you don't get. Yeah, but, I, can, I can answer that for you, and I'll answer it this way. Everybody who goes in, and sometimes buying a car can be a, a pleasant experience and it can be a miserable experience. And when you run into packages like that, it, it can be a miserable experience. But you know, it gets blamed onto the dealer. And it is not the dealer. The dealer only gets from the factory what the factory is willing to produce. And it may be Honda, it may be Chevrolet, it may be whomever. John, speaking of bad guys. Yeah. Your, your industry, uh car sales persons, is that mm. politically correct That's for perfect. the 90s? I've got it. Mm. Mm. have a pretty shabby reputation. Where'd that come from? Is it true today? Has it changed? I, no. I, okay, let me get back again. Um, you know, car salesmen develop or they, they end up getting a, a bad reputation primarily because of the buying process which is involved. For instance, you said you hate it when you can't get this and that and you have to have a package and the salesman is only really a negotiator between you and management. And what he's trying to do is to smooth the way through for you and to show you your options and how you can, I assume, or we presume, purchase this vehicle. That's all, it, it all goes back to horse trading, which everybody loved. Now, I've been in this business for far too long, I think, <laughs> and I've worked on the floor, and even today, I still go out on the floor and I still have fun and I still talk to all sorts of people. Most people that I deal with anyway, and maybe it's just my company, enjoy the buying process. There are lots of houses in the city where that process is not necessarily that much fun. Um, you know, what happens in, you know, we're, we're in, a, in a terrible recession at the moment. Cars, there's far too many cars being built. There's far too many dealers. There's far too much of everything. There's far too much choice. And all of a sudden the dealers, because they can no longer compete against each other. You know, when you get down to cost, how do you go any lower? So now all of a sudden it's starting in the States, it's coming up into Canada, it's the no decker price. This is the price, this is what you buy, this is what you get. Okay, let's bring it round to the quality of the North American car. Now, I don't care what anybody says, North American cars are better today because of the Japanese influence. When they first came out in 78, they were dangerous, they rusted out. I saw one with a front cross member, had totally rusted out. Today, they've won more used car buyers awards from different associations, CAA. Toyota's won it seven of 10 years, I think. They're great cars. Now, I know that you disagree me on this point. Great cars? They're cars. They're not great cars. You know, drive around the streets in this city. You show me 
a 10, 12, 14 year old, anything built in Japan. I never see any. I don't see them. I agree with you. I okay. mean, they, they've only got so, rid of the rust problem since about 1983 onwards. I don't disagree with that. That's why you don't you. see old cars. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you know, the European cars, which I happen to prefer, because with a European car, there's nothing rice pudding -y about it. That's the only word I can use, you know? There's nothing wrong with rice pudding, but it's dull. And they happen to build dull cars. I can't, and I'll probably lose my job after this, but anyway, um, they do build dull cars, you know? I always maintained that if you blindfolded me and I could drive, which is a difficult thing to do, blindfolded, trust me, you could put me in a German car, an English car, an American car, a French car, an Italian car, I can tell you the country that manufactured that car. Why? I mean, because each one of them has a particular direction when they build character. the car. They yeah. have a character. Yeah, they soul. have something. Never, 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 never care about that. No. The average driver just has a vehicle that will take him or her from point A to point B. Exactly. You're a, a car driver. is You're an somebody appliance. Who appreciates yeah. cars and knows what good driving and. and Enjoyable driving is all about right. it. So it matters to you. Most Luxury is a bonus. Luxury is a bonus. Carol, why, uh -huh. why would anybody uh -huh. buy buy a new car for mere transportation? I don't know. If you want that. mere transportation, you buy a four-year-old Oldsmobile, drive it till it drops, and, throw and away excuse by the me, I happen to be I happen to be in retail in. sales, and if people don't care, I bet you if you came into my showroom, you'd be going, oh, oh, wow. And this is from someone who doesn't care. Listen, the finest piece of That's transportation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the finest piece of transportation, and we'll get some real hoo has over this, was the Mini, the Austin Mini 850. It was brilliant. small, it was boxy, Absolutely it carried brilliant. four people, a little bit of luggage, it did 50 to 60 miles a gallon. It was the perfect car. In fact, the Honda Civic was the one that was designed from that. No okay, it was, transverse, it was also, also transverse, interesting enough, a great race car. Yeah, and it, it turned out it had character and it was a great race car. Why, so did, why did we start yeah, building happened. different cars? You know why? Because everybody wanted something new, including general public, which is the one you referred to, who said, I don't want to do anything but have a, something that will take me from here to here. I don't care about character. I don't care about soul. You know, I think, yeah, I think that's what people though, say right? that a lot of people cars. say that a car is an extension of their person personality. Now you sell luxury cars. Our Midas tip of the week concerns shop manuals. You know, there was a day when you bought a shop manual so that you could do all your own maintenance and repairs, but today. You may want to buy a shop manual, even if you're not interested in doing any of these operations yourself. But you'll be a more educated consumer, and you'll be able to discuss repair and service operations with your mechanic. I'd strongly suggest that anybody concerned with good service on their vehicle buy one of these manuals. For example, these three on the end are dealer-type manuals that you'd buy from the respective dealers, a Ford truck shop manual, Chev Celebrity, etc. These are $35 to $40 range and keep them with the vehicle as a, as a permanent record of your service. These two in the middle are professional type manuals by Mitchell. They're basically factory shop manuals that have been edited and made more user friendly for people like myself. These ones on the other end are the type that you find in bookstores, 25 to uh, $30 neighborhood, and they give you expanded coverage, for example, import and domestic, light truck, etc. There's an awful lot of good information in these manuals. They make good gifts as well, and I'd really suggest you get one and keep it with the car. If it saves you one hour of labor or one broken part over the lifetime of that vehicle, it'll pay for itself. That's your Midas Tip of the Week. John, one of the things that makes me crazier than anything else is your narrow, just dialed in enforcement of arbitrary speed limits. Justify it. Here, here. True, true. Go true. Ahead. One more true, one more true. <laughs> speed limits, I feel that the speed, speed limits aren't set, first of all, by police. We don't set the standards of the speed limits. We don't set the, the speed that you go or in the areas that you do the speeding in or the, the limit of the speed. I personally think that, yes, it has to be posted. Basically, some kind of control. It just shows it's there. It's a reminder for people not to go over 100. People inevitably do go over How 100. did you arrive at 100 clicks? Yeah. But better, but more than that, Gary, is 
why do from? you only enforce the speed? I mean, you spend so much time sitting at the side of the road, clicking away at anybody that happens to goof up a little bit, when if you travel on the 401, for instance, which I know is not necessarily your territory, but or any you know, there's, or, yeah, yeah. or any Canadian highway, there's, there's people, they, they have the, the worst driving habits in the world. They never get stopped. If you're, if you're driving across the white line, if you're going this, you never get stopped. If you're going too fast, you get stopped. And I think it's just a simple, easy way to collect, money. is there a quote it's of, a or money? It's a source of revenue. It's just, it's, it's just revenue. an easy way to do it. Sit there on Millions a bridge and wait and let them come no. to you. So what, what happened to going out on the road? The guy no, 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 go ahead. The, 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 the municipality where I live, right, come the end of the month and the coffers are a little shy, everything and anything gets ticketed for the slightest thing. Believe me. You, could, you can tell no. from the 28th to the 30th. Left. You don't. <laughs> okay. going, going back to the Stone Ages here now, like we were talking about cars here. No, now the reason for doing the radar enforcement, the reason for setting it up in, in sort of primary locations, they are picked. They're not randomly selected. Officers who are out on that stretch of highway, for example, of multi-lane highways, they know where they have their problems. They know where people start speeding up. They know where all of a sudden the traffic slows down. They know this guy that's coming up at 130, 140 kilometers an hour but speed. doesn't know what's happening at the other side. What it is there is it's an education factor. If you catch a few people, you catch one speeder, everybody else that goes not by slow will people see down, John. that he has been caught. Temporarily. We took a look at 40 fatal crashes about two years ago at a coroner's inquest. 60 fatalities, 60 people died in these 40 fatal crashes. All the, the uh, assumed reasons why people crashed were completely trashed by the data that was assembled. The majority of the people crashed at or below the arbitrary speed limit. They had 13 years of driving experience. It was in perfect weather, daylight, sunshine, no problem at all. Uh, what was the other one? Very few impaired. All the myths that we built up, people were not speeding and were crashing. All they were doing, touching the gravel shoulder. And cranking the wheel and crashing and the that car. Stretch Nothing to do with speeding. But that, but that, all goes, that, back to, that goes to back to driver training and driver education. Sure it does. Absolutely. Oh, what we're talking about here is speed limits. The, the thing with the radar unit is, from my point of view, it's a deterrent. No. It does deter two points. I, I can say because even in school areas where we've had people go through at high rates of speed, it's deterred those people because if they know police or radar is set up there, for example, if you go by the same way to work and the same way home every day, you're going so to start to slow down in that yeah. one But it place. doesn't make you a better driver. It just makes you a better your best no, lap time on that is, That is, is as far as I'm concerned, there. the biggest source of conflict between the public Absolutely. and the police. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that has driven a wedge between the public and the police. You could be sitting it's there the and you PR may have, you may have rolled through a stop sign, blown a red light or something, and you get ticketed. You're mad at yourself. You get a speeding ticket. You know as you're sitting there. Having that ticket written, yeah. that everybody is going by doing exactly the same speed, yeah. and it makes yeah. not a damn bit of difference. Yeah. But the fixation with speed. It is a fixation. It's We're a completely fixation. ignoring and everything else. And, it and again, no it's a public perception. The insurance industry, the police, the, the, the ministries have sold this bill of goods for how many yeah. years now? Speed kills, speed kills. Excuse me. Speed does not kill. It does Stopping it abruptly in, kills. In, yes. in a pharmaceutical yeah. sense. Speed kills. Speed kills. Well, this gang yeah. is probably going to be talking into the morning when the dealership opens, but we've got to go. We're out of time, but maybe, maybe we'll pick up on the conversation on a future program. And speaking of future shows, make sure you tune in next week as we present Motoring 93's Car of the Year special. We'll see you then as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Motoring 93 has been brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, one tough motor oil, and Midas, your under-the-car specialists for imports and domestics. Motoring 93 now has a limited supply of high-quality sweatshirts, t-shirts, and baseball caps. For more information or to order, just call this toll-free number, 1-800-926-1111.